correction. Thank you. Thanks, Venkat. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a tutorial in two parts. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one flavor of codes for cloud storage. Alex Dimakis is going to start uh, talk is going to talk on Thursday and Friday about a second flavor of codes. And then the first part is also in two parts, and uh, welcome to part one. So unlike Jay Kumar, I cannot assume that the objects I'm going to talk about are intrinsically worthy of study. You know, two-party communication has been studied for over 30 years now. The codes that we are going to talk about are at most five years old. So I'm going to spend some time trying to convince you that these are actually objects worth study. Okay. So let's start from what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Well, the problem is us, basically. There's a huge amount of data that we're all generating. And we then expect that this data is going to be stored somewhere out there in such a way that we can access it whenever we want from our laptops, from our phones, and so on and so forth. And on top of that, we'd like to have all this storage for free. Right? So how does this really happen? And uh, before we jump into this, I mean, we've all heard these numbers, but I thought it might be good to do a little toy experiment about you know, how much data is really being stored out there. So to start with, you know, when I go home, I'm going to have to prove that I actually did something today. So let's say I decide to take a photo just to prove that uh, you know, I actually gave a talk here. I can't get my phone to switch on, so let's just pretend I took a photo. How much does? Theoretical. Theoretical. It's a, it's a Windows phone, you know. <laughs> Maybe I switched it off. OK. So anyway, how much does a typical photo, if I had taken one on a phone like this, what size is it? Well, I actually checked this out just for this talk. I didn't know the answer either. A reasonable answer is that it's in the range of, say, around 300 kilobytes, 200 to 400 kilobytes, right? So how much is that? 300 kilobytes is basically 3 into 10 to the 5 bytes. Let's measure everything in bytes, right? And let's say that, on average, I take one photo a day, and there's about, say, 360 days in the year. So in one year, just the photos I take alone, it's going to be something like this number into 365. Now, we're only interested in orders of magnitude. And I checked this before I came here. I think this is about 10 to the 8. <laughs> All right. So this is about 100 MB of data that I'm generating on my phone every year. How many smartphones are out there in the world? Again, I don't really expect anyone to know the answer to this. It's about a billion, right? So it's about 10 to the 9 smartphones. OK, let's multiply these two. And you know, this is pretty average usage. I'm not even talking about videos and things like that. There's people who have cats and so on, who obviously will take way more phones, more photos than I. So in total, just from photos from smartphones alone, the total volume we see out there is something like 10 to the 17 bytes. So OK, we all know what a gigabyte is. That's 10 to the 9. Then comes a terabyte, which is 10 to the 12. Then comes a petabyte, which is 10 to the 15. This is about 100 petabytes of data. And you know it's a huge number, and by no means eventually all of this finds its way onto the cloud somewhere, right? Like when I actually manage to switch my phone on and connect it to my computer, there's like three competing programs that want to back it up onto their own cloud, right? So all of this data eventually finds its way out to the cloud. How much does it cost to actually store this amount of information? Now we've also heard truisms like data is cheap. Right, like storage is cheap, right? So the total data stored in the cloud, it's of the order of exabytes. Exabytes is like 10 to the 18. It's you know, maybe a few tens or hundreds of exabytes at this time. A terabyte hard drive on Amazon will cost you about $100, right? So it is cheap, but not compared to the scale of data that you actually need to store. So just storing the raw data, OK? on these kind of commodity hard drives is going to cost you hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? So hardware is cheap in the sense that you know, a, you know, x amount of storage costs you much less now than it did before. But just the amount of data we have to store is completely insane. And 
Okay, so this is, and yet somehow we get all this unlimited cloud storage for free, right? So what's going on here? This is the fundamental problem that this work is trying to address, right? And is this just about you know saving big bucks for companies like Microsoft and Google, which is not terribly exciting to me and should not be exciting to people here in this audience. But you know, there's more to it than that. Data centers, they consume about 3% of all global electricity production. I, this, you know, I got it from the internet, take it with a grain of salt, but you know, data center footprint is a real concern for, you know, of currently. All right, and these numbers, they look pretty big by themselves, but that's until you start multiplying them by a factor of three. So why would you do that? Well, this is the way that data storage has been done till very recently, right? So, okay, let's start from the most basic scenario where I have something like six machines. Well, when I talk about machines, I'm just thinking about hard drives storing data, okay? Let's say that our goal is just to tolerate one disk failure the simplest thing that you could do here is to just duplicate all your data, which gives you a 2x overhead. The advantage, of course, is that recovery is very quick. Suppose you, know, you request your email and that machine is down for some reason, we just direct you to a second machine and you don't notice any difference. Right? Now, the overhead you're paying is pretty large. In terms of reliability, if you just wanted to tolerate one disk failure from these six machines, there's a much simpler solution, at least a more space efficient solution, which is just treat, just use a simple XOR, basically, the parity check code. This is what RAID 5 does. You treat each of your disks as this huge bit vector, as this huge bit vector, and you just, you have five data disks, the sixth disk will store the XOR of these, right? So this gives you a 1.2x overhead, which is much better in terms of storage space. The price you pay is slower recovery. Like suppose now I request my email and that machine happens to be down. What's really going on is that you're reading data from five other machines, exhorting all that data together. So, you know, it's obviously something that's going to be much slower. All right. Now let's talk about two disk failures. So then, okay, so this is kind of, what was the, or what is the industry standard, because most places with store data are still doing duplication, right? So you just take everything, du replicate it thrice. It has the same advantage of quicker recovery, but now the price, of course, is that your overhead is three times. In place of this, RAID 6 would use a 6.4 RAID Solomon code, where basically what you do is you have four data disks, and then you generate two more parity disks, right? Now, the, what is the cost here? The cost is slower recovery as before. If you actually have two failures now, it's not even as simple as you just exhort a bunch of things together. It's actually a small two by two system of linear equations that you need to solve, right? Okay, so, all right, so now read solomon codes are the first solution anyone would think of when they're trying to switch away from replication. <coughs> so everybody in this audience has probably seen read solomon codes before, but just, you know, for someone like Venkat who hasn't seen read solomon codes, I'm going to introduce them. So uh, you have something like k data symbols and n minus k parity check symbols, which are generated from these data symbols using some you know, linear combinations over finite fields. And the really awesome thing about Reed solomon codes is that the field size is just linear in n. If by the end of this tutorial I can convince you that this is, you know, it's really a miracle of nature, then this tutorial will have been successful, right? And the nice thing about Reed solomon codes is that they are maximum distance separable. What this means is that, okay, you have k disks worth of data there. Obviously, you need k disks surviving in order to recover your data. And MDS, the, being at the MDS bound guarantees that it doesn't matter which k disks survive, you can have some mixture of data and parity disks. As long as you have k disks, your data is safe. Right. Okay. So now the question is, what parameters of n and k should we be using in practice? We are using four six. six we were talked about six four Reed-Solomon codes, which is what RAID does. 
you know, why the setting of parameters? Could you do something differently? And here is the somewhat, you know, to anyone coming from a communications perspective, you know, coming from the communications worldview, whenever you transmit over a channel, you assume there is a fixed failure probability P. So naturally, as your codes grow longer and longer, you expect the redundancy to scale linearly. Well, in storage, it just seems that people do not scale redundancy linearly. Right? This, this is how it is. Now, this is actually going to be important to what goes, what I'm going to talk about. So I'll try and you know, give you some rationalization of why this is the case. This is basically the case because disk failure rates are really low. So think about the probability that a disk is going to crash on any given day. We know from experience that this is not very high. Right? So OK, so this probability of failure P is something really, really tiny. So let's say that we initially are coding over 10 disks. Now we go to 20 disks. Now, expectation is linear. So I expect you know, the expected number of disks that will crash is going to be twice. But two times epsilon is still a very small number. It's very close to 0. Right? And what are people trying to do when they switch from replication to coding? Their goal is only to make sure that your data is as safe now as it was before when they were doing triplication. Okay. Is this the right thing to do? I don't know. So when you started off using your email provider in 2005, you know, they were doing triplication, let's say. Now they are using some other error correcting code. They have so much more data, so many more users now. Your data is probably as safe as it was before, maybe even a little safer. Now, just with the increase in the number of users, you'd assume that they're having more failures, and that's probably true. But you know, they try to, they don't try to ensure that, okay, the chance that I'll ever see a failure now is going to be the same as it was in 2005. They just want to say that each person's data is as safe as it was before. So they're comparing themselves to three-way replication. Right? And now you start to see why it is that you don't necessarily need to scale redundancy linearly. Say that P is the probability of disk failure. With three-way replication, your failure probability would be something like P cubed. And if you have K users, you know, it would be, well, it's at least P cubed. It's more like K times P cubed. Now let's say I'm using a Reed-Solomon code, which has distance even one better. So you need four failures for data loss, right? So now these, each event which causes data loss has probability something like p to the 4. Now sure, you're coding over k machines, so there are something like k choose 4 possible bad events. But still, these numbers are so small that this number is still you know, going to be way smaller than this. Okay. So you know, it's not the, in some sense, this is how it is when people uh, with the current numbers, when the lengths of code increase, the redundancy does not scale linearly. Something little of k, like you know, maybe even logarithmic, seems to be sufficient. Okay. Now, given that if you accept this as a given, then really, instead of using a 6-4 Reed-Solomon code, you could use something like, say, uh, you know, a 60-50 Reed-Solomon code or a 100-105 Reed-Solomon, you know, so basically the overhead should be going close to zero, you know, just by using longer and longer codes because the redundancy is not scaling linearly. So is this what really happens? The answer is not really. You cannot do this because the cost of recovering data then would just be too high. And this is the MDS property coming back to bite us. Typically, the failures you see are not three and four disk failures. They're just single disk failures, right? And by the MDS property of Reed-Solomon codes, even to recover this one disk worth of data, you have to read k other disks in entirety. This is a property that we use all the time in designing secret sharing schemes, for instance. And you know now it's not such a desirable property. And the trouble really is that now you're in a distributed storage system. These disks, you know, maybe they're distributed across data centers, across locations, and so on. 
each disk read is pretty costly, right? So having to wait till 25 disks respond to you, you'll probably never be able to serve users' data. So this is what limits us in practice to using small values of k in Reed Solomon codes. And of course, if the length that you can use is you know, only of the order of 20 and 25, then you need some amount of redundancy there, like you know, three or four. So you won't actually get overheads which go towards one. Okay. So let me say a bit more about the kind of these failure scenarios which are typical. The most important failure scenario is what is called a degraded read. So the idea here is just that somebody is requesting their data, and that particular machine is either failed, or it's slow, or it's down for an upgrade or something like that, right? So if you were doing replication, of course, then you could just you know, direct that request somewhere else. If you're using erasure coding, something like Read Solomon, then there's more work involved. You need to read k other disks, compute out some linear combination, and serve that to the user. In fact, if you were using something like Read Solomon, since any k disks suffice, what you'd probably try and do is to read all these disks that are available. And you know the first k which respond to you, you use that to serve the request. So these kinds of reads are called degraded reads. Disk failure is a much more unlikely event. So what happens here is that, OK, a disk has failed, and we've decided that we want to replace it. Now, again, the same thing happens, but the main difference is that now you're just trying to recreate it on some other machine, and there's not some person who's actually waiting there for this data to be served. All right? OK. So now the question is, can we do better using erasure coding? Right? So, and it's clear that there's something here which just rate distance trade-offs are not going to capture for you because Reed Solomon codes are optimal as far as you know meeting the single 10 pound goes. It's some other property you need which addresses you know how much time it's going to take you to fix these typical failures, right? And there have been two notions. So the first question is to identify what it is that we want to optimize now. And there have been two notions proposed in the literature to address this. The first of these, it's work that you know, started right here in Berkeley, work on regenerating codes due to Dimakis, Godfrey, Wu, Wainwright, and Ram Chandran, and now this is a thriving body of work. The metric that they identify here is network bandwidth. They say that in order to recover a single disk contents, I don't want to communicate too much data over the network. Right. Locally repairable codes were, you know, they were as a, they were introduced a couple of years later, and I'll you know, tell you a longer story about how they came to be. But the metric here is the number of disks that you need to read, the number of disks that need to respond to you in order for you to serve the user's request. Right? So you want to imagine a scenario where, you know, which is common in data centers, that the disks are doing a lot of things. They are serving other readers' requests and so on and so forth. So every time you ask to read something from the disk, it's not that you get what you want immediately. You have to stand in queue, the disk finishes whatever it's doing, and then eventually gets to you. So it's important that you, know, you don't try and you don't need a response from too many disks. So the metric here is the number of disk reads. And for reasons that I don't fully understand, and perhaps Alex will explain later, we're going to do this in reverse chronological order. So I'll talk about LRCs first, and then he's going to talk about regenerating codes later. Right? OK, so one question might be, which of these is the right model? Right. So this is a bit like asking, if you have an algorithm, do you want it to be time efficient or space efficient? You, know, you want both, right? So this is, and in fact, there is a lot of work at this point which tries to get the best of both worlds. In this talk, though, I'm going to focus on locally repairable codes. OK, so part one of this tutorial is going to focus on this notion of locality. I'm going to introduce a formal definition which captures this notion, and we'll talk about rate distance trade-offs when locality is also something that we care about. And in tomorrow's talk, we'll address the reliability aspect of these codes uh, in more depth. Yeah? So we'll try and ask, what kind of failures are we actually trying to tolerate? Is minimum distance really what we want from our codes, or is it something else? Okay. So locality. 
So locality is a notion whose, you know, I would say it's time, not only has its time come, it's come several times over. In the past few years, there have been several works in the literature, all of which independently identified that this is the problem with Reed Solomon codes, and some notion like this would fix it, right? So there's this work of Chen Huang and Li from 2007, and then, you know, a lot of many other independent works following that. A formal definition of locality was given in this <coughs> paper, uh, which is joint work with Sergei, who's here, and uh, uh, Cheng Huang and Hussein Simitji. So we say that, OK, so I'm going to talk only about linear codes in both these talks. Okay? So we're going to say a coordinate in a linear code has locality r. If I can recover this coordinate, from our other symbols in the code. Since it's a linear code, this means that I can write this coordinate as some linear combination of these r other symbols in the code. Okay. So this is a very simple definition. This is what locality is. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. So any r other a fixed set of r other coordinates. Yeah. So you know, so a simplest example is that in a in a two three parity check code where I have x1, x2, x1 plus x2, every coordinate has locality 2 because I can read, I can recover x1 by reading x2 and x1 plus x2, you know, well, that's the length of the code, so there's nothing non-trivial going on here, but in any code, the locality is of a particular coordinate is, okay, this coordinate is something, how do I, suppose this coordinate is lost. What is the smallest number of other coordinates I can then read to write this thing, to express this as a linear combination of those coordinates? So is that clear? I think so. So you, you, yeah, there must be one set of coordinates that are coordinates. Yes, I mean, otherwise the, you know, so if it's a code, right, presumably it has some distance. So by reading everything else, you can certainly recover this coordinate. Or reading, you know. I think his question is: Is it any other R coordinates you could read and you get it back, or is it a specific? It has to be a specific set of all. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It, ha you know, it, it cannot be any other coordinates. You know, for if e uh, if the ith coordinate is lost, then you say, oh look, there is this set there, tuned to this particular coordinate that I can read, which will recover it for me. Okay, so. Um, basically, this says that if CI is lost, it can be recovered by reading just R other symbols, which R other symbols, of course, depends on which I, which coordinate I was. Right? Okay. We're going to distinguish between two kinds of locality. One is data locality. Now, data locality is a notion which applies only to systematic linear codes. And actually, I should have said that in this talk, we're only going to talk about systematic linear codes because the systematic property is very important in data storage. You do want a raw copy of everybody's data there. In addition to that, you can have some encoded information as well. Right? So data locality is where all the data symbols are guaranteed to have locality R. So this really captures this degraded read scenario, where if somebody is requesting their data, then that I can serve by reading just R other coordinates, which is R other disks, right? Now, no one is ever going to ask for the XOR of my email, your email, and this person's email. So you know, we, the notion of locality for the parity check symbols is not as natural. It won't come up in the degraded read scenario. But of course, disk could crash, and then to maintain reliability, you have to reconstruct these symbols as well. So it is a natural notion too, right? And if every, we're going to consider two kinds of codes, codes with data locality R, and codes with all symbol locality R, right? OK, so what is the bottom line here? I mean, we're doing something very simple. We're just saying that, OK, we are trying to decouple the complexity of typical kind of failures from the complexity of worst case failures. Because a lot of time in data centers, you really are dealing with single disk failures. In fact, it's often not even failures. It's things like, you know, Windows needs to upgrade every once in three days. So you're taking a bunch of machines down. You'll do it carefully, of course. But while the machines are down, you do need to serve these requests. So the important thing is that once your overhead drops below 2x, you only have one copy of the real data sitting in the raw. 
So if that data is for some reason unavailable, you have to use the code in order to serve these requests. All right. Uh, so we are giving you this definition. It guarantees our rates for single failures. It doesn't give any guarantees for worst case failures, right? And really what you want is R rates not just for single failures, but R rates for whatever the typical failure scenario might be. And we'll talk about this later in tomorrow's talk. Okay, so this is a good starting, this is a good point to talk about where these codes, at least they're, you know, where these codes came from. So locally decodable and testable codes, they are very well studied in the computer science literature. So the first work on LDCs was probably the Goldreich-Levin uh, result, which gave a list, a local list decoder for Hadamard codes. This notion was formally defined in work of Katz and Trevisan in 2000. And by now, there's a body of beautiful work on it. And Sergey here has written a book on this topic. And really, I would say that this notion of local decoding was implicit, at least, in early works in coding theory, like Reed's majority logic decoder for reed muller codes, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. It isn't stated in the language of locally decodable codes, but it's very, a lot of these majority logic kind of decoders, it's very easy to think of them as local decoders for codes. Right? And the goal here is to have local decoding up to the minimum distance. So this is typically in the scenario of errors rather than erasures, but we can think about it even for erasures. Think of the number of erasures as minimum distance minus one. I'm still guaranteeing that each coordinate, erase coordinate, I can recover by reading just our other coordinates. Much stronger than what we are aiming for in this talk, right? Okay, now, yeah. Is there any duality between this and low density parity check codes? Because there you want low density in the <coughs> check in the, matrix. In the parity check matrix. So I don't think so, you know. So uh, I, I'm sure people have. There, we by now know how to construct expander codes, for instance, which have good locality properties. So this might be a specific instance where you get both these properties, but I don't know of very, any very general connection, maybe. So one thing, if I may add to this, a check, a check with small degree is a local repair group that is small. So you will get locality just by having one check for one check covering every symbol. So you get locality from that. So yeah, so those codes with with small dense, yeah, such codes would probably guarantee you locality in our sense, but I don't know. LDC is a very strong notion, and you know, I don't know of a generic relation of the kind that you're asking. The, the, the objective is different, however. In, in, you know, in LDC, typically you care about distance, which is a harder thing than just covering everything with a small local group. So there is connections, but you know, they haven't been developed too much. Okay, so locally decodable codes now. Again, it's a very strong definition, and the problem is that these are really hard to construct. You know, if you want constant locality for constant relative distance, so you're guaranteeing locality not for one failure, but like, you know, n over 100 failures, then you actually have super linear lower bounds on the encoding length. So this was in the early work of Katz and Trevisan. In fact, it's very interesting that if you read the introduction to their paper, they say that such codes would have given fault-tolerant storage with unlimited scalability. They realized that this would be a really terrible thing, so they threw a lower bound saying that such codes are actually not possible. Unfortunately, they didn't slam the door shut you know, hard enough. So, you know. uh, so the best constructions we have are super polynomial. And off late, there's been a line of work where we relax the locality constraint. We say that we don't want constant locality. We are willing to, you know, end to the epsilon is also great, for instance. And now we are actually seeing codes which have rate, and they have fairly high rate. Right? So, okay, so this is certainly something which, you know, influenced us in our work. I should also mention the notion of locally testable codes, which solves the membership in the code problem with locality, which are closely related to locally decodable codes. All right. So 
let's start by examining this notion of codes which have data locality. So data locality means every information symbol can be expressed as a linear combination of our other coordinates. Okay. So this is a very simple notion. It's also very simple to achieve. This was already you know, observed in this paper on pyramid codes where they say, well, if you want a code with data locality, there's a very simple way to get it from Reed solomon codes. Just take the first parity and kind of break it up. Let's assume that the first parity in the Reed solomon code is just a simple XOR. Now, instead of doing the simple XOR of everything, you just do the obvious thing where you break your data symbols into groups of size R, write down the parity for that. Now, you spent K over R additional parity checks, and you've got your distance up to 2. Right? Now you throw in the remaining parity checks from the Reed solomon codes. This gives you a final code which has distance d and whose length is something like k times 1 plus 1 over r, right? Because you have the k data symbols, you spend k over r just to get this locality property. Okay, so this is a simple construction, but it incurs this linear overhead in terms of k to get the locality property, right? And remember that we said that d is pretty small compared to k. So here, it's not the distance, but it's the locality that's causing the linear overhead. The question, of course, is whether this is really necessary. Okay. Now, OK. Now, if you wanted locality for all symbols, again, there's a very simple thing you can do. You have a bunch of parity checks lying around. Well, you know, throw a local parity for them as well. If you do this in the most obvious way, then you know you'll the you know basically the length scales up by a factor of r plus one over r, and now you get locality for everything. Again, you could ask, is this the best one can do? Okay, so this is basically, in other words, what we're really asking is, what are the trade-offs between n, k, and d, the usual parameters of a linear code, and this new parameter we've introduced, which is the locality r. So in this work, what we show is this, that in any linear code, even if you only care for information locality, then the overhead you need is k over r plus d minus 2. It's exactly what you're getting from this pyramid code construction. So the high order message is that if you want locality, you need a linear overhead. Conversely, if you could say that if somebody wants a storage system where their overhead is only 1.1x, that means there are going to be some degraded reads, which will require you to read something like 10 other machines. Okay. All right. So yeah, just rewriting this so that the linear overhead is necessary. Moreover, you know, we can show that essentially such codes need to look extremely simple. They basically need to look like this pyramid code construction in the following sense. To make our life simple, I'm going to make the assumption that this parameter r divides k. And really, you have this huge file which has been cut into so many chunks that really, you know, k, you can make some simple divisibility assumptions about it. It's not unreasonable at all. So what we can show is that if r divides k, then any code which achieves this bound with equality, it looks like this, essentially. You take your, OK. So there's also a restriction here that the distance d needs to be sufficiently small, which I'm brushing under the carpet. But with these restrictions, any code just needs to look like this. You basically take your data symbols, break them into groups of size r, you write down a parity check for each of them, and then you have these remaining parity checks. If d is small, these actually will not have locality r. They cannot. So we'll see why this is the case when I show you the proof of this lower bound in a minute. Right? So I guess one comment about this is that if the locality, so locality k is usually, it's always easy to achieve. Read solomon codes do that because any symbol you can recover by reading k other symbols. Right? If you plug in r equals k here, what you get back is the singleton bound. So you could think of this as an extension to the case where you want non-trivial locality. OK. So what happens in the setting? So codes with data locality, we're saying that we understand them pretty well. Not only do we know the best length you can achieve, we also understand a fair bit about the structure of any such code, which is fairly rigid. In the setting of small d, the only 
freedom you have in some sense is how you choose these parity checks, these D minus two non-trivial parity checks. Okay. So now in the setting of codes with all symbol locality, we say that the only way such a code can achieve all symbol locality is the following. Uh, you can partition these coordinates into groups of size r plus 1, which satisfy a simple locality relation. Right? More, actually, it's a much stronger statement, which we'll get to when I actually do the proof. So one thing that this says, however, the lower bound stays the same. Yeah, that's the point I want to make. You do not get a stronger lower bound. right? So in some sense, if you want to achieve locality here, you can't just do the obvious thing of take these parity checks and put a local parity on them. Each parity check that you add, it needs to increase the distance. And then for some reason, these things happen to satisfy a local relation. So do such codes actually exist? And the answer is that they do. So in this paper, we show that they exist over sufficiently large fields by some non-explicit probabilistic construction. <coughs> and a sequence of subsequent works actually makes this explicit and gives you codes with all symbol locality, which meet this lower bound. Okay. So, OK. So let me just tell you about these results. And then in the remaining time, yeah, sorry. Oh, is Q the field size? Sorry, oh, Q is the field size. Yes, yes. Q is, sorry, I didn't mention what Q is. So yeah, we say that you can get all symbol locality. But in our proof, you know, it's non-explicit. And we only prove it for very large field sizes. So explicit constructions, by now there are three, at least three of them, more in fact. There was one due to Tamo, Papailiopoulos, and Dimakis, which works which all of these constructions will give you all symbol locality. The first construction uses a combination of Reed-Solomon with some ideas from Metroid theory. Another construction due to Silberstein et al., again, the length, the field size is exponential in the length of the code. Their construction is based on Gabardulin codes, which are basically linearized analogs of Reed-Solomon codes. Finally, a very nice and elegant, well, all of these are elegant, but you know, a recent construction due to Barg and Tamo it gets the field size down to linear. And these are based on reed solomon codes. OK. So the plan for the talk now is that I'm going to show you this lower bound. And then time permitting, I'd like to show you as many of these constructions as I can. So if you can switch the projector off now, that'll be great. Can you just tell him to switch off the projector? Thank you. Yeah. So the first order of the day is to prove this lower bound, saying that if a code has, you have an NKD linear code, linear code C, which has data locality R, then the length must be at least k plus ceiling of k over r plus d minus 2. Okay. All right. So one way to prove this, there are a lot of proofs by this time, is to use the following view of codes. I'm going to think of a linear code, C, as being specified by a sequence of points, C1 through Cn, living in Fq to the k. Okay where n is the length of the code and k is the dimension. So think of these as just a set of n points in k-dimensional space. And to encode any message x using c, you write out the inner product of x with all these n points. Right? Think of these as measurements. Okay. So this is what a code is for us. Now, obviously, the first thing you want is that the C1 through Cn, they ought to be full dimensional. Otherwise, this is not enough information to recover x. So having good distance means that the code is very robustly full dimensional in that. So OK, now let's imagine an adversary who comes, up, who comes along and erases some of these inner products that we have. 
So we get some subset of these inner products then, and now we are trying to reconstruct x from that. As long as this subset which remains is full dimensional, we know that we'll be able to get x back, right? So having distance d is just saying that any subset of, so let me put it this way, any subset obtained from C by removing D minus 1 points is k-dimensional, which is to say it's full dimensional. So to, by turning the statement around, you can think of it as a way of proving an upper bound on the distance of a code. Exhibit a large collection of points, which is only k minus 1 dimensional. Right? If you manage to find that, then you're proving that the distance of this code is not too great. And so the plan of attack is basically that you're going to exhibit a k minus 1 dimensional subspace. In an MDS code, you'd only get size k minus 1. Here we'll get something which is larger by a factor of 1 plus 1 over r. Why are we going to be able to do that? Well, what is locality in this view? For a coordinate to have locality r, it basically means it satisfies a linear relation with some r other points, right? So now let's think of these r plus 1 points. There are r plus 1 of them, but they're all sitting in an r-dimensional subspace or smaller, right? So this code has living inside it many of these r-dimensional subspaces, which actually contain one more point than you'd expect in an MDS code. The plan is simply to stitch these subspaces together to the point where we get a k minus 1 dimensional subspace. Okay. So we're going to think of this. Oh, OK. So now let me set up some notation. I'm going to define this hypergraph H, V, E, where the vertices V is some subset of C. What subset will become clear? The edges correspond to all tuples C1 through CR plus 1 which satisfy a non-trivial linear relation, such that summation lambda i c i equals 0 for some lambda i's. And we might as well restrict ourselves to minimal sets of points which satisfy a linear relation. Okay. So this is some r plus 1 hypergraph on the vertices here. And if a node is not participating in any relations of, in any edges of this hypergraph, I just throw it out. So that is why the vertices are some subset of these point, of the, all the points in the code. Okay? And now I'm going to use this hypergraph to come up with this large k minus one dimensional subset using the obvious greedy algorithm. Right? So here is an algorithm to build a k minus one dimensional subset, a large k minus one dimensional subset. Basically, you just greedily keep choosing edges. I'm, I'm not even sure what's greedy about it. You just choose edges from this hypergraph. Every time you're getting r plus one points, but you know that the dimension of your set is only growing by r. Right? The only tricky part is that you don't want to actually allow the set to ever reach dimension k. Right? You want to stop at k minus 1. So we just need one line of code to account for this case. Right? So you start off from your set S being the empty set. And you keep repeating the following experiment. You pick a point C, which is not in S currently. So, OK, so while the dimension of this set S is strictly less than k minus 1, you take some point which is linearly independent of the things which are currently in your set, C not in, I should say, span of S, okay, and which participates, and C participates in some edge, which means that it's a vertex of this hypergraph, okay. So add an edge E containing C to S. 
Now, as I said, so what we are doing is the obvious thing. So we have a set S. Its dimension is not full currently. OK, so one thing I forgot to mention. What does the property of data locality mean in this point of view? If you had all symbol locality, then every single point would participate in an edge. If you only have data locality, the only thing you can guarantee is that the set of points which participate in some edge, it is full dimensional. So as long as S has not grown to full dimension, you'll be able to find a point out there which increases the span of S that you can add. right? Add an, add, add an edge E containing C to S. Now we have to be a bit careful about you know, adding this edge and actually hitting full dimension. So you'll only do this in the following. So this, you actually, I guess I have to just rub it out and write it again. So pick E, which is this thing. You take an edge E, take edge E containing S, containing C. So if adding, if adding this edge to S doesn't make your dimension full, if the dimension of this union is less than or equal to k minus 1, add it. Else, only add a subset. Add a subset E prime of E. So add a subset so that the dimension actually just becomes k minus 1, and you stop right there, right? Because you don't want to hit dimension key. OK. So how large a set did we get by this procedure? So basically what's going on is that for every increase of r in the rank, you're guaranteed that the cardinality is at least increasing by r plus 1, right? So by the time the size grows to k minus 1, the Sorry, by the time the rank grows to k minus 1, the cardinality has grown to something which is basically a factor of r plus 1 over r times k minus 1. And this is basically what this lower bound tells you. The lower bound here is saying that this, there is a set of size roughly k plus k over r, which has dimension only k minus 1. So let me write this down in some detail. The way to actually do this analysis would be as follows. Let SI be the number of points added at step i. And let RI be the rank increase at step i. So what we know is that SI equals RI plus 1 for every step except possibly the last, where maybe you hit k, so then you just have to throw in a linearly independent set of points into your collection. Right? Now we know that the final rank sums to k minus 1. And at each step, you know the rank is only increasing by r at most. So there are k over r steps, or rather, you know, yeah. So here is where you have to do this case analysis carefully. Since I only have five minutes left, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. But the total rank sums to k minus 1 in L steps. At each step, the rank can only increase by r. So you know there's only this divided by, there have to be at least this divided by r steps. And at each step, your cardinality is increasing by 1 more than this. So summation of SI is at least k minus 1 plus ceiling of k minus 1 over r. Not exactly what I promised you, but that's where this case analysis comes in. You do it correctly, and you'll get exactly that. Okay. So, okay. so how do you finish the argument? We found a set of cardinality something like this, whose dimension is only k minus 1. And then we just appeal to this. We say that, look, the distance can at most be n minus the size of the set. Because just by deleting everything outside the set, I have shrunk the dimension. Right? So this is exactly what your bond is saying. Okay. So actually, by looking at this proof carefully, you can derive a lot of information about the structure of this hypergraph when this bound holds with equality. The situation where the bound holds with equality is the following, that 
you go on adding these edges of size r plus 1, the rank is increasing by r at every step. In the last step, however, you hit dimension k. So then you give back a couple of points. You only get to increase cardinality by r minus 1 and rank also by r minus 1. Okay. And from that, you can conclude things like, look, this hypergraph looks very simple. It basically consists of a bunch of disjoint edges of size exactly r plus 1. Because if there was a smaller edge there, you would do better in this algorithm, right? So think of this as a greedy algorithm, which is trying to you know, increase the rank by getting a really large set. Small edges are good for you, because instead of paying r plus 1 to increase the rank by r, maybe you know, if I get a smaller edge, then I'm doing better in the analysis of the algorithm. Similarly, intersecting edges are also good for you, because for the same reason, they allow you to build up the size of the set even more by paying less in the rank. Okay. And from that, we can conclude that codes like this, you know, so I, again, I'm hiding a lot of details here, but in the setting where D is really small, you can conclude that these D parity check vertices, they just have to be isolated vertices. There's no room for them to have edges because either those edges would be too small or they would overlap with other edges. All right. So now, in the five minutes remaining, I'd like to show you at least one construction of a code which achieves all symbol locality and meets this bound exactly. Okay. I'm going to show you this construction due to Silberstein et al., which is based on Gabardulin codes. So this construction, it's going to be, um, yeah, so it's based on linearized polynomials. So first, some parameters. So if you want a code of dimension k, your message space, you start off with a field f, which is 2 to the n, where n, well, actually, let me call it 2 to the n prime. n prime will be related to the final length n of the code as n prime is n times some small constant factor. Okay, I'm going to make all kinds of divisibility assumptions here. Okay. So we are, our codes are going to live in this field F2 to the n prime. It's a large extension field of F2. The polynomials are going to be of the following shape. They're going to be polynomials of linearized degree k minus 1, which is all things of the form ci times x to the 2 to the i, i going from 0 to k minus 1. <coughs> and the reason these are called linearized polynomials is because of the following property, which is quite easy to check, which is p alpha 1 plus alpha 2 is p alpha 1 plus p alpha 2. This tells us that the kernel, the zero set, okay, so this is, you can view this polynomial as a linear transformation over F2. When you view F2 to the n as a vector space over F2. And the set of zeros, it's going to be a subspace. It can have cardinality at most 2 to the k minus 1, because it is a polynomial, a univariate polynomial of that degree. So the dimension of the zero set, the dimension of x such that px is 0, is less than or equal to k minus 1. Right? So these are the facts of, about linearized polynomials that we need to know. Okay. So now here's their construction. It's really nice and elegant. The first thing you do is to pick a basis for f2 to the n prime. Let's call that alpha 1 through alpha n prime. Okay. And then you just write down the Reed-Solomon encoding, but only of linearized polynomials at all these points. So you have p at alpha 1 through p at alpha n prime. Okay. Now what you do is to break these into groups of size r each. All these coordinates, you break them into groups of size r. There's no locality at this point, and we're going to create this locality now. Right. In addition to these points, I'm going to write down the evaluation p at the point alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha r. Which 
by linearity, it just happens to be the parity check of all these entries. So this is the same at p alpha 1 plus p alpha 2 plus p alpha r. Do this for every coordinate, right? Do this for every group, rather, right? So to have a picture in mind, we started off with a basis for the space. OK, so what is the length of the code? Well, for every r, I added one more parity check. So the length is n prime times r plus 1 over r, which is n. To have a picture in mind, here is what we are doing. We took a basis, alpha 1 through alpha n, for the entire space. We grouped these into things of size r. And for each group, we added the evaluation at one more point in that group. Okay. So this is the code. Now, what is the distance of this code? Right? So, so we know what the so so here we're just going to use this theorem, which is to say that, you know, so what is the largest set of points on which a polynomial like this could vanish? It can vanish on a k minus one dimensional subspace. What is the largest subset of this set of points which only has dimension k minus one? Again, you do the obvious thing, which is whenever you take all these points, you better take the point which is linearly dependent on them. And you go on doing that, okay? And if you do it this way, the distance that you, the number of points at which, you know, what is the size of the set over which it could vanish, it will come out to be something like k minus 1 plus k over r minus 1, which exactly matches what it should be there. I'm doing this a bit briskly. So basically, to get a k minus 1 dimensional subspace, you'll do the obvious greedy thing, where you'll basically be able to choose these many groups. For them, you'll get this one extra point, which is linearly dependent on the others. In the last group, you will not have enough dimension to take the last linearly dependent point. Okay. So let me just, I'm out of time here, so let me just wind up here by pointing out one stronger property that this code has, which I think is extremely natural. In particular, it implies the distance property that we want, which is that finally, so we started off by picking alpha 1 through alpha n prime as a basis, and then we added this alpha 1 through alpha r, an additional point, right? But really, these r plus 1 points are very symmetric in the sense that any r of them form a basis, right? I take r points in the first group, r out of r plus 1 from the second group, and so on and so forth. I get a basis for the entire space. So what this tells us is that if I take this code and puncture one coordinate per local group, the restriction is an MDS code. Right? Because then you're back to the univariate polynomial being evaluated at a bunch of linearly independent points. Right? So this is a stronger property, which I'm just hinting at. I leave it as an exercise for you to check that this actually implies optimal distance. This, in some sense, is the strongest property you could hope for from a code which has this local structure in it. And we'll hear more about this in tomorrow's talk. Thank you very much. Is that really all you have to worry about? And yeah, because these are disks, right? So if a disk is not responding or it's... They don't serve bad data. Yeah, that is a, you know, so, I mean, if you're thinking about internal disk bits getting corrupted and so on, that is a problem, but that's taken care of by the erasure coding at a disk level. Here, it seldom happens that I ask this disk for some data and it gives me absolute junk. That might also have something to do with David's question, where if you're thinking about those are sort of more general. Oh, but he was asking about LDCs, I guess, and that it really is erasures, sorry, errors versus errors. David's question was, I thought uh, like LDCs. LDCs in, in that case, you're usually tolerating errors. Not just... Yes, yes. No, not necessarily. You would also do no, it. could be erasures. My question was not erasures versus errors. It was about the connection. The yeah. okay. so, so, so let, let me answer this about this uh, about the relation to uh, 
to, to, to low density energy codes. So, Richard has been talking about, I mean, mainly about what we call LRCs. So, call, and in LRC, if you look at the energy metrics, the condition is that for every coordinate, there would be a single uh, low weight contain that involves the Spellis check. This is much weaker than you have it in LDPC codes, right? So there you would want to have a basis of the dual space uh, to be formed by these low weight vectors. So, I mean, this is much weaker. But then he also, Parikshin also mentioned that other class, low, uh, LDCs, so low, um, locally decodable codes. So there, the condition is in fact much stronger than in LDPC codes. So in LDCs, in locally decodable codes, you want the following problem. All short dual constraints, then if you take any coordinate, then not only it should participate in, in many, many of these, they need to have some nice algebraic type. One can expand on what that exactly is. So it's in fact much more than just having the duals, the basis for the dual space <laughs> being spanned by short dual vectors. So LDPCs, they sit somewhere in between LRCs and LDCs. So that's, that, 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 that's how the relation is. Meet again after lunch, one thirty.